from the heart of our nation's capital, here's Family Research Council President Tony Perkins. Well, good afternoon and happy Friday to you. Hope you've had a fantastic week. I'm Jody Heiss, Senior Vice President of the Family Research Council and your Friday host. Honored to have you making Washington Watch part of your day. We've got a tremendous lined up for you. Let me give you some of the headlines that we'll be covering. The window is closing rapidly for Congress to reach a federal spending deal. In fact, in just a few hours from now, there'll only be one week until a partial shutdown of the government takes place. And so what can we expect in the coming week? And in the midst of it all, will there be any wins for conservatives in Congress? We have 7.3 million people who've come into this country illegally. 7.3 million, and Joe Biden wants to make it an even 10 million. That's insane. No country would ever tolerate this. And so my position to my colleagues on Capitol Hill is clear. You either secure the border or you get no money for the government. Well, that was Florida Congressman Byron Donald speaking yesterday at the Conservative Political Action Conference, also known as CPAC. I'll be discussing the latest on all of this with Montana Congressman Matt Rosendale. We'll also look at some disturbing effects of the woke policies in the Department of Veterans Affairs and also some breaking news with him as it looks as though a potential another balloon from China may be floating across the West even as we speak. And then we have a Missouri school district that has evidently shown students a video discussing gender identity and sexual orientation without having parents notified or given the option to opt their children out. All of that would be a violation of state law. We'll hear from Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey on how he is responding to this school district. And the Alabama State Supreme Court upheld the sanctity of life this week in a decision stating that the state's Wrongful Death of a Minor Act applies to all children, including the unborn. And as expected, the left is going crazy about that. With this decision out of Alabama, Alabama, IVF is under attack. This is the chaos that has come out of the Dobbs decision. This is the chaos that has come out of, uh, of getting rid, rid of Roe, which was the law of the land for almost 50 years. Well, that was White House Press Secretary Corrine Jean-Pierre earlier today. FRC's Mary Zock will join me to explain the potential precedent that this case sets out. So you want to be sure to hear that a little later on the program. And then a big question. Is the Biden administration activating federal civil servants for the president's reelection campaign? Well, as we continue our election integrity series here on Washington Watch, I'll talk with Hans von Spakovsky, who's the manager, uh, manager of election law reform initiative at the Heritage Foundation. He's got some tremendous insight to bring our way. So we have a packed program for you today. You don't want to miss a bit of it. But if for whatever reason you do miss a portion, you can always catch up by going to our website, TonyPerkins.com. Of course, there's tons of resources there, including notes on today's program and archives of other programs. So you don't want to miss it. Again, that website, TonyPerkins.com. All right, let's jump into the issues for today. Members of Congress continue government spending negotiations. Um, and more so, that is heating up as the deadline for a partial government shutdown rapidly approaches. And as a, just as a reminder, if a deal is not reached before next Friday, March 1st, then multiple federal agencies will shut down. And then within about a week after that, the lights will go out on a host of others. So this week, members of the House Freedom Caucus sent a letter to House Speaker Mike Johnson seeking an update on their conservative policy priorities, things that include included are like abortion, uh, immigration policy, wasteful spending on uh, certain federal official salaries and so forth. So what can we expect when Congress returns next week? Well, joining me now to discuss this and much more is Montana Congressman Matt Rosendale. 
He is a member of the House Freedom Caucus, as well as the Veterans Affairs and Natural Resources. He represents the 2nd Congressional District of Montana. Congressman Rosendale, my friend, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to see you. Good to be back on with you, Jody. Well, listen, before we get into these other things, breaking news right before we came in, and I know there's probably not a whole lot of information right now, but it appears there may be another balloon from China floating over the West, over your state, perhaps. Uh, do you have any more breaking information other than that? The information I just got literally before I climbed on with you, Jody, was that uh, there's been another balloon spotted. This one seems to be hovering over Colorado. Uh, and it, it, as always, it gives me grave concern. From Colorado, it can still make its way over the uh, nuclear uh, field that we have down there in that part of the world, that Nebraska, um, South Dakota, you know, region, part of Colorado. They have the ICBMs um, in another location there. And we certainly know that the uh, first Chinese spy balloon that was sent over um, the United States about a year ago which was located over Montana, spent several days hovering over the ICBMs that are, are controlled by MAMS from Air Force Base. And that's when we had the real big problem, uh, the first real big problem with Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin, uh, first uh, denying that it existed, second, denying that it, collect, that it was able to collect information, and then thirdly, denying that that information could be transmitted back to China, which is what brought me to, to uh, bring forward the impeachment resolution for him, amongst other things. So one can only hope that this balloon, uh, maybe it is just a weather balloon. I, I literally just heard about it before I came on, but, but if it's not, then I would certainly hope that our government would take appropriate action to bring that thing down in a safe manner so it doesn't hurt anyone, but to make sure that it does not collect and transmit sensitive data uh, back to China, if in fact that's where it came from. Absolutely. Well, we'll be watching this. And of course, right before coming on, as you mentioned, I saw your post on X and thought, wow, here we go, deja vu uh, all over again, as the saying goes. All right, let's go into some of these other things. We're approaching the final window, if you will, on these appropriation bills. Uh, what do you anticipate happening as Congress comes back? Well, you know, when I left last week, I saw several NFL coaches out there walking around the streets of Washington, D.C., uh, looking for hunters, because I will tell you, that's the only thing that they've been able to produce on a regular schedule in Washington, D.C., are people that are willing to punt these problems down the road, and the NFL is always looking for another punter. Um, we we have <laughs> well, not you can't even make a team of punters. <laughs> yeah, we have not concluded the appropriations, uh, twelve appropriation bills for fiscal twenty four, and here we're rapidly approaching um, the time that they are supposed to be delivered, which is June thirtieth for fiscal twenty five. Uh, so my expectations, unfortunately, Jody, are very low that we're going to be able to get the parties to come together in this. When I see an article today that came out that the Democrats say the problem with all of this is the Republicans keep trying to insert poison pills. Insert poison pills? What we're trying to do is stop using taxpayers' funds for things that the American people don't support. They don't support taxpayers' dollars, as you stated, being used for abortions. They don't support taxpayers' dollars being used to support transgender surgeries for people that are in the military. They don't support taxpayers' dollars for the United States military to try and develop battery-operated vehicles and, and, and enrich uh, people that support the New Green Deal, they're, they're, they're leftist supporters. So if that's what they call a poison pill, I just call it being prudent with the taxpayers' dollars and going to Washington to do what I was expected to do, asked to do. And, and so as we look next week, um, I, I'm very concerned that we're just going to be asked to, to approve another continuing resolution which by definition continues Nancy Pelosi's spending levels and Joe Biden's policies. And, and I won't be a party to that. Well, and we're grateful for that. I tell you, it's a, it's a mess. And at the same time, with all the list of things you mentioned that Americans don't want, they do want a secure border. And that's all been wrapped up in so much of uh, multiple talks, as you well know, that you yourself have been heavily involved with. 
If we can, Congressman, switch gears a little bit because our time is slipping away from us, but you also serve on the House Committee of uh, Veterans Affairs and a psychologist working for the Department of Veterans Affairs was recently placed on administrative leave after speaking out against the gender ideology that you just referenced. Uh, what do we know about this so far? So we're trying to get more information on this issue, but we do know that the Veterans Administration has been trying to um, promote DEI standards within the organization and diversity, equity, inclusion. And so when they start talking about diversity, equity, inclusion, they're not talking about uh, civil liberties. They're not talking about equal rights, everyone being treated the same. They're talking about giving preferential treatment to the uh, groups that they believe uh, have been slighted. And, and so what really bothers me is when they're allowing transgender men, men who, who are claiming to be or, tr or are confused and, and think that they are women, to be sharing the same spaces as women. Some of these women have been sexually assaulted. They have been extremely stressed. And we have already invested incredible amounts of money to make sure that our women veterans when they go into these facilities, that they feel safe, that they feel included, that they have special spaces just for them because of the, the, the things that they have gone through. And now to think that the Veterans Administration is going to turn that on its head and start opening those doors up to, to men who think they are women or, or worse, yes, nefarious actions that they are just claiming to think that they are women is, is just beyond uh, anyone's belief. And, and so we're trying to do everything we can to make sure that this doesn't take place. Well, thank you for your leadership with that and a letter that uh, you and Eli Crane wrote uh, to try to, to get to the bottom of all this. You know, at, at the end of the day, the Veterans Affairs is supposed to be about veterans. Uh, and it seems like they are the ones who are hurt when the uh, bureaucracy itself gets engaged in political agenda as opposed to the uh, responsibility and the duty, the job that they have to do. That's, look, they receive $350 billion a year, and I'm trying to make sure that every penny of that gets directed to providing benefits for our veterans. And, and so I've got a good working relationship with Secretary McDonough. I'm hoping that he will take this letter very seriously and help us root out uh, this, this misuse of funds and this just miscalculation of, of how people need to be treated. If a transgender individual comes into the Veterans uh, Administration, clearly they need, they need counseling. But I don't believe that the taxpayers should be providing for the cost of surgeries. And I don't believe that they should be allowing them into these areas that have been reserved for biologically born women. Yeah, you know, I think the vast majority of of American citizens look at these kind of battles and literally scratch their heads in disbelief that we are even legitimately having these kinds of discussions and de debates on the federal level. It is just absolute uh, lunacy to many uh, millions of us, that's for sure. Congressman Matt Rosendale, always great to see you. Thank you for the incredible leadership you provide to your state and our country. Thank you for joining us today on Washington Watch. Thanks for having me on, Jody. You have a great evening. You too. All right, friends, after the break, Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey will be joining me to discuss a Missouri school district that may have violated the law in its curriculum. So stay tuned. We'll get to this story right after the break. The Lord reigns. Let America rejoice. From coast to coast, let justice reign. Peace reign. Righteousness reign. Lord, let it rain. May the clouds of blessings gush and rain down upon us. Yet even in the clouds, we see the light of your face. Make your face shine on these states, we pray. We pray and then we work. We work in the strength you provide. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Strengthen our hands to do all to God's glory. Whether we eat or drink or vote, everything is holy. So we vote to God's glory. We vote because we can. We vote because we love our nation. We vote because we love our people. The people rejoice. 
When the righteous rule, but when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Adorn our land with oaks of righteousness. Place men, place women, place those in authority who know their place, who know that they are under authority. Men and women who will stand for the true, for the good, for a more beautiful America. But how can they stand if we don't stand? We must stand. Lift us up. Help us stand. Raise us to that summit, which is yourself. For those you raise to that summit, do not fall. You are able to keep us from falling. Until that day when we do fall, fall before your throne, where our king reigns now, now. Let us rejoice and pray, vote, stand. Amen. Good afternoon and welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your Friday host, Jody Heiss, and we are honored to have you on board with us. All right, a Missouri school district showed students a video discussing gender identity and sexual orientation and did so apparently without notifying parents or providing an opportunity for students to opt out, which is in violation of state law. Well, this drew the attention of Missouri Attorney General Andrew Bailey, who sent a cease and desist letter regarding the material. Uh, Attorney General Bailey also confronted a second Missouri school district regarding intimidation tactics against whistleblowers in the ongoing lawsuit regarding the district concealing its student bathroom policies. Well, joining me now to discuss all of this is the Missouri Attorney General himself, Andrew Bailey. Attorney General, thank you so much for joining us. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Thank you so much for having me on. Well, it's always an honor to have you. And boy, you've got a lot going on, as you always seem to. Uh, let's start with the material shown to students without parents' knowledge or the ability to opt out. Tell us what's, what happened there, what's going on. Look, there are very strict guidelines built into Missouri statute that govern what can and cannot be taught when it comes to human sexuality. And one of the provisions in the statute uh, is a parental opt-in or opt-out procedure. In other words, schools have to abide by the curriculum standards and statute and have to uh, present that curriculum to the parents. And the parents get to decide which curriculum is appropriate for their children. And the whole point here is that Missouri parents don't co-parent with the government. The curriculum needs to be consistent with the parents' values and the check and balances that the parents can opt in or opt out. And so uh, this is our General Assembly, the elected representatives of the, 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 the people's elected representatives speaking through statute that's been passed by the General Assembly and signed into law by the governor. And so when local school officials ignore that statute, it undermines the rule of law, it harms children, and it's a direct assault on parental rights. So we put the school on notice that we're not going to tolerate violations of our law, and we're going to stand up and protect parental rights here in the state of Missouri. That's incredible and extremely a powerful statement to say the parents don't co-parent with the state, and yet that seems to be like a rash across the country, the attitude of government uh, wanting to intrude and take over parental rights. Now, as I look at this, Attorney General, it, it appears to me that there is an affiliation uh, between these videos, the curriculum, and Planned Parenthood. Is that correct? That's absolutely right. A lot of the materials 
uh, were presented by a, by a Planned Parenthood affiliate. You know, the materials promoted casual hookups for teens, uh, promoted uh, you know research into abortion and uh, LGBTQ issues. And again, these are direct affronts to our statute. These are issues of human sexuality. It's not a celebration of diversity. It's a perversion of the law uh, to call it anything other than curriculum, because clearly they're trying to teach and sexualize the kids. And we're not going to let that happen. And they're doing it with an obvious bent. I mean, when you pull Planned Parenthood into the equation, everybody knows what Planned Parenthood's all about. And, and it is directly in opposition to the values of at least half of our country. So to do so is nothing other than an attempt to push a political agenda, it seems. And then you have uh, the, the Winsfield School District possibly using intimidation tactics against some whistleblowers there. I, I don't know, it kind of sounds like uh, witness tampering to me. I, do, you, do you agree? I mean, what's going on there? Yeah, so look, we had whistleblowers that are currently on the Winsville School District School Board who came forward to my office and said that they had objected when the board went into closed session and removed the public from the meeting in order to adopt a radical transgender policy. And when they objected, some of the responses they got were that it was none of the parents' darn business what the transgender policy was at these schools. Well, clearly, again, this is another direct affront to parental rights of the state of Missouri. And it also violates our state open meetings law. And so these board members did the right thing and objected and then came forward as whistleblowers, swore in aff affidavits, and my office didn't hesitate to file suit. The, the school board has got to respect the parents' rights to determine these t sorts of policy decisions and ultimately have a voice in that process to ensure the safety of the children and the children are being exposed to things consistent with the parents' values. So that as that lawsuit's ongoing, and as soon as that lawsuit kicked off, the other board members and some of the entrenched interests at the school began a baseless internal investigation, essentially weaponizing the, the personnel policies of the school against the whistleblowers. And that is absolutely an intimidation tactic. They've been uh, demanded, censorship demands have been placed on these whistleblower board members. Uh, there have been intrusive searches into uh, the, their uh, their use of email. So this is all, uh, again, designed to harass and, and intimidate uh, brave men and women who voluntarily serve on these boards and put themselves uh, out there in the public domain to do the right thing by children and parents and are now being intimidated because they wouldn't go in lockstep with a radical transgender bathroom policy. Yeah, it's it's just incredible. Well, thank you for standing up for that. I, as I mentioned coming in when you first came, oh, you got a lot, of, a lot on your plate right now because when all this is going on, we had uh, this week the Supreme Court on Tuesday declined a case about whether potential jurors can be excluded based on their sincerely held religious beliefs. And all of that originated from a lawsuit against the Missouri Department of Corrections for discrimination against a, a lesbian employee. So we had three jurors who were removed from consideration due to their biblical beliefs. And Justice Alito, he pointly, uh, rightly pointed out that Americans are going to have to hide their religious beliefs or otherwise they're going to be labeled as bigots and treated as such by the government. Uh, so what are the ramifications of this? I, I love your, your take on it. Well, we're not going to let radical left-wing progressives relegate Christians to second-class citizen status. The right to participate on juries is codified in the United States Constitution, and uh, that's a right of citizenship. And look, Christians uh, are able to follow the law just like anybody else. And this is the exact problem that was pointed out in previous uh, United States Supreme Court case law when they were uh, analyzing the constitutionality of some of these anti-discrimination statutes where some of the dissenting judges said, look, you're opening up a can of worms here because you're going to run in direct conflict. The only people being discriminated against uh, when the states pass these anti-discrimination laws too often are Christians, Christians who believe in biblical truth. And that's exactly what we see. This is where the rubber hits the road. When the uh, judge said, hey, I'm not going to let these Christians be on this jury because I don't think they can be fair and impartial, despite the fact that the jury jurors specifically said, we are Christians, we have uh, sincerely held Christian beliefs, but can follow the law. I mean, that's again, that is relegating Christians to second class citizen stat status by kicking Absolutely. them off the juries. We can't let that happen. Thank you, Attorney General Andrew Bailey from Missouri. We deeply appreciate your hard work and thank you again for joining us on Washington Watch. Have a great weekend. Thanks for having me on. All the best to you.
Thank you. All right, friends, after the break, FRC's Mary Zock will join me to discuss Alabama's Supreme Court decision upholding human rights for human embryos. You heard that right. Huge story, huge decision. We'll bring it your way right after the break. Stay tuned. Thank you again for these dear friends and those who serve, who you've called here to serve. We've heard their hearts this morning, God. I pray that you encourage them. I pray that you give us all wisdom, discernment, stamina to do the things that you have called us to do. And as Solomon asked, and as we repeat, Lord, that you would give us the courage to walk in your ways, to follow your commands, and to stand for truth so that we can govern and administer justice in a way that is pleasing and honorable to you. We ask and pray and believe all this in Jesus' name. Amen. above all names by which we must be saved, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, the light of the world, the glory of Israel, the only answer, the only hope America has that it might yet again shine as a city on a hill. No revival comes without repentance. So God, we pray that we would own our own sin. God, that we'd walk before you in constant revival. What have we done to our children? We are teaching them that there is no God and that they can define good and evil. Lord, have mercy on us, Lord. Lord, I pray that you would commission us to go and make your word known and your truth to a world that is in desperate need of that truth and that hope. Lord, I pray that we would answer the call and say, here we are. Send us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon. Welcome back to Washington Watch. I'm your host, Jody Heiss, and an honor to have you on board with us. Okay, in a decision that upholds the sanctity of human life, this week the Alabama Supreme Court ruled that frozen embryos are considered children under state law. They said that the Wrongful Death of a Minor Act applies to all unborn children, regardless of their location. That's an amazing statement. Well, this decision comes from a case to decide whether parents could sue the Mobile Infirmary Medical Center after their frozen embryos were destroyed there at the facility. In his concurring opinion, Alabama Supreme Court Chief Justice Tom Parker stated, even before birth, all human beings bear the image of God, and their lives cannot be destroyed without effacing His glory. Well, joining me now to discuss this is Mary Zock. She's the director of the Center for Human Dignity here at the Family Research Council. Mary, welcome back to Washington Watch. Great to have you. Thanks so much for having me on, Jody. All right, well, look, before we discuss this decision, I, I find the, the facts of this case r really horrifying. Uh, and tell me if I'm incorrect, but it, from my understanding, a patient there at the Mobile Infirmary Medical Center was wandering around, wandered into the storage facility, removed some of the frozen embryos, and then dropped them uh, after suffering some freezer burn. What in the world is going on with the way these embryos are treated? You're exactly right, right, Jody. The IVF industry is is like the wild west. There are there are no regulations governing governing that industry, and and couples are paying upwards of fifteen thousand dollars per round of IVF. Not to mention the emotional and physical turmoil that IVF takes on a woman's body and and on her husband too. Um, and and so the fact that there is nothing regulating this industry, that that their children could be treated so cavalierly that a complete stranger could walk in and drop them, shattering their future, literally shattering their future. Um, that That's a tragedy in and of itself. 
Yeah, it's just it's stunning to even think how this could could happen. But but then we have the Alabama Supreme Court upholding the reality that these unborn babies are in fact babies. I mean, that's amazing. How important uh, do you think this decision really is? I think it's huge. What the Alabama Supreme Court said was that the location of where a person is doesn't determine whether or not that that human being is a person. So the people of Alabama have have placed into their constitution an amendment that affirms that life begins at conception, that that unborn children should be protected. And what the Supreme Court of Alabama did in this case was to say, yes, and it doesn't matter where that unborn child is, that child is always worthy of protection. And, and that's helpful for you and I too, because that means our rights are protected as well. Yeah, I, I was just going to say that. I mean, it, uh, you, and you've got on the other side of this whole argument, uh, the just unbelievable language. The Washington Post reporter, for instance, came out saying, welcome to the theocracy. I mean, we're going to hear more and more of these type of accusations. But like what you just said, this is not just about, as important as this is, obviously, but it's not just about the sanctity of life, but this is also about uh, the Alabama state constitution. This is not about theocracy. This is about the rule of law and the sanctity of life. Right. 59% of people in Alabama voted to declare that unborn children are worthy of protection. This is the Alabama Supreme Court saying, hey, we can't make exceptions because you're an IVF clinic who's going to profit off the hopes and dreams of women and in massive amounts. We're not making an exception for you because you're an incredibly lucrative industry. An unborn child is a child no matter where that child is, and that child deserves protection. Uh, it really does. So uh, one of the largest uh, hospitals in Alabama. After this decision, they, they stopped or maybe paused. I don't know what the, the right terminology is, but they at least paused uh, IVF treatments. Do you think this might be indicative, perhaps, of how embryos are treated in the hospitals as well? I think it absolutely is. The IVF industry has an incentive for couples not to be pregnant during the first round. The, the IVF cycles cost upwards of $15,000 per round, somewhere between 15 and 30,000. The, the longer it takes for you to get pregnant, the more money the IVF industry is racking up. And so when we see that, that a hospital in Alabama has to shut down their IVF clinic, we have to question, well, what is it that you're doing that, that you couldn't actually ensure that some random person doesn't walk in there and destroy the children that these couples who have struggled with infertility for years have, have created? Are you anticipating that we're going to continue, just like the Washington Post reporter accusing welcome to the theocracy, Kamala Harris came out, uh, likewise, just bashing this decision, calling pro-lifers hypocrites and all sorts of things. Are you at all concerned that we're going to see more and more of this, these type of attacks against pro-life community? We absolutely will. And, and the truth is that the pro-life movement has always wanted what is best for both the mother and the child. The IVF industry is exploitive. It is not a solution to infertility. And in fact, it doesn't ever address what the underlying cause is in, in infertility. It, it just places a bandaid on what could be a serious health problem for women. So if Kamala Harris is actually concerned about women, she should be trying to encourage the investment of resources in things like NAPRO technology that Absolutely. actually gets at the root of infertility. Mary Zock, Director of the Center for Human Dignity at FRC, thank you so much for this incredible input that you've given us. Stay tuned, folks, much more right after the break. Hello, I'm Tony Perkins, President of Family Research Council. Sometimes the headlines are overwhelming and it feels like we're alone and there's nothing we can do. That is exactly what the enemy wants us to believe. Reading through the Bible, there are many things that are counterintuitive. One of them is that God never uses a majority. It is always a minority devoted to the truth. Here at Family Research Council, we're grateful to stand side by side with other believers for the truth. And as a result, 
God is making a difference. When you partner with us, you're joining with Christians around the nation and standing together for the truth of God's Word, supplying pastors and parents and school boards with training and resources to stand up against the indoctrination of your children. I invite you to become a stand member and stand with FRC today. Together, with God's help, we can preserve freedom for the next generation. Go to frc.org and become a stand member today. Again, that's frc.org. Stand with us. Research has found that there are 59 million American adults who are a lot like you. There are millions of people around the country who are born again, deeply committed to practicing their faith, and believe the Bible is the reliable Word of God. But that's not all. They're also engaged in our government. They're voters. They're more likely to be involved in their community, and they're making a difference in elections. The problem is that a lot of them feel alone too. We want to change that. FRC wants to connect these 59 million Americans to speak the truth together, no matter the cost. If you want to learn more about this group and what it means to be a spiritually active, governance-engaged conservative, or if you want to find out if you are one of these sage cons yourself, join us. Go to frc.org slash s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sagecon, to learn more. That's s-a-g-e-c-o-n, sagecon, to learn more. I'm Tony Perkins and I have a prediction. This year there will be uncertainty and continued political and cultural division. Okay, so that's not that startling of a prediction, but try this, we can have peace and even joy amid the chaos. Jesus said in John 15, these things I have spoken to you that my joy may remain in you and that your joy may be full. Jesus told us there would be days like this so that our eyes would be upon him and his promises rather than our circumstances. Now, how can we keep our eyes on Jesus? Abide in Him by being in His Word. At Family Research Council, we want to help you do that, which is the reason for the Stand on the Word Bible Reading Plan. With just 10 to 15 minutes each day, you will have read the entire Bible in just two years. But most importantly, you'll be abiding in Him daily, living in His joy and peace in these trying times. Join me on this journey through the Bible. Go to frc.org. Welcome back to Washington Watch. Thank you so much for joining us on this Friday afternoon. I'm your Friday host, Jody Heiss, and we're glad to have you. All right, we, we've got some recent reports. I'm sure you have heard this by now, but it, the reports have confirmed that at least 12 employees of the uh, United Nations Relief and Works Agency, also known as UNRWA, uh, they were involved in the deadly October 7th attacks in Israel. And beyond those 12, UNRWA employees uh, also had some 30 additionals who assisted in those attacks. And then there were an additional 200 that are operatives for Hamas or Islamic Jihad. And because of all these reports, the U.S. funding for UNRWA was paused. All right. That's a good start, perhaps. But a mere pause in funding is not what, what not what's needed. We need to stop funding UNRWA entirely. And so we here at FRC, we applaud Congressman Chris Smith for introducing H.R. 7122, which is the Stop Support for UNRWA Act. And we're asking you to join us and sign a petition as we're trying to put some uh, weight behind this and try to get some pressure for Congress to stand with Congressman Smith. So if you would sign that petition, to encourage Congress to stand with Israel and to end UNRWA funding, we would encourage you to simply text the word UNRWA. That's U-N-R-W-A, UNRWA. Text UNRWA to 67742, or if you'd like to go to the website, you can simply do that by going to frcaction.org slash UNRWA. And uh, thank you in advance for your support. All right, each Friday we have, uh, for several weeks now, we have been trying to feature on Washington Watch a segment that highlights news and issues related to election integrity. And by the way, I've mentioned, but I have a book coming out on this topic. It's coming out on April 4th on this very issue of election integrity. It's entitled Sacred Trust, Election Integrity and the Will of the People. Uh, so that'll be coming out in early April. We encourage you to uh, keep a lookout for that. But 
Shortly coming into office in 2021, President Biden signed an executive order that directs federal agencies to get involved with elections. Yeah, you heard that right. And by doing this, it establishes at the very least, it establishes the opportunity for federal employees to engage in partisan political activity. That in itself is a violation of laws such as the Hatch Act. Well, it should be no surprise to learn that according to records, uh, specifically records that have been obtained by the Heritage Foundation's Oversight Project, the U.S. Department of Agriculture is now working with an advocacy group on the left for voter turnout initiatives. Yeah, that's no surprise either. So as part of our ongoing series looking into election integrity initiatives this election year, I've invited Hans von Spakovsky to discuss what appears to be the president's attempt to hijack the federal government for his own re-election campaign. Hans is manager of the Election Law Reform Initiative at the Heritage Foundation. He also served two years as a member of the Federal Election Commission, which of course is the authority charged with enforcing campaign finance laws for congressional and presidential elections. Hans, welcome back to Washington Watch. Always great to have you. Well, it's, Jody, it's nice to talk to you again. Well, likewise, and uh, you're looking good, I've got to tell you. Uh, listen, I, 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 many of our viewers and listeners right now have to literally be screaming on the inside when they hear news right. like this, say, whatever happened to the Hatch Act? I mean, I, th this is a provision that prohibits federal civil servants from engaging in such activity. Uh, what is the White House doing? Well, I don't think the White House cares about that. Um, look, what, what, what Biden did is issue an executive order, as you, as you said, that reaches all levels and every single department of the uh, executive branch. And what he did is he told every single department to come up with a strategic plan. So it doesn't matter whether it was Department of Justice or the Department of Defense come up with a strategic plan to engage in voter registration with any and all individuals that you deal with and to help them with their uh, voting process, obtaining absentee ballots, et cetera. And of course, one, he doesn't have the authority to do this. Two, he's never been authorized and uh, provided any funding with this. But look, Jody, you, you know the biggest problem with this. Assume that you are, for example, applying for Social Security disability benefits. And the clerk you are dealing with says, oh, by the way, we may want to be sure that you get registered to vote. Oh, and here, I want to help you with your absentee ballot. Well, the people that apply for benefits for the federal government are often elderly disabled, very vulnerable. What's their thought going to be? Boy, I better vote the way the White House would like me to vote. I better vote to support Democrats who control the government. Otherwise, I might not get my benefits. Wow, it's frightening. So it is, you know, but still, still, this is all such a violation. I remember my, my time on the oversight committee. We dealt with this issue over and over and over. And uh, how is the White House claiming? Uh, how are they justifying this, or are they even trying to justify it? They're they're not. They're just doing it. And and the fact that. Um, Look, all these Freedom of Information Act requests uh, have been filed, not just by Heritage, by, but uh, other organizations, too. And the White House and the U.S. Department of Justice have been fighting, fighting all attempts to turn over any of this information. In fact, um, lots of litigation lawsuits have been filed to try to force them to provide it because they don't want to do it. And by the way, part of the order— uh, and this this uh, is relevant to the Department of Agriculture. Part of the order was that they should contract with third party organizations to help them with this voter registration. Well, they certainly aren't going to contract with any conservative organizations. All they're doing is going to their political allies, left wing advocacy groups to help them do that. In essence, what they're doing 
is moving the get out the vote campaign that normally political parties and campaigns have to uh, pay for. They're moving that into the federal government and having the federal government get out the vote for Joe Biden and his uh, political party and his candidates. I think that is an excellent way of looking at this. So uh, to take that understanding a little bit further, that basically what the president is doing is creating their own partisan get out the vote operation. Yes. But but even beyond that, they're doing so at taxpayer expense. So the taxpayers right. who oppose this political agenda are having to pay for this political agenda being pushed and to get out the vote operation uh, for something uh, that they disagree with. No, that's right. And you know what's what's most ironic about this is because you mentioned the Hatch Act. Look, one of the one of the big scandals that led to the passage of the Hatch Act in the 1930s was because in states like Kentucky and Tennessee, uh, Democrats, bureaucrats working for Roosevelt's um, agencies like the Works Progress Administration were telling local folks, oh, do you want to get a grant or a loan from the government? Well, you better make sure that you vote the right way in the upcoming elections. That scandal helped get the Hatch Act passed. Wow. All right, so tell us about, you mentioned a third party group that the Department of Agriculture is now working with. As I understand it, this is a, a New York based group, DEMAS, that uh, it, it literally helped draft the executive order that That's right. President Biden has used to push this policy. Uh, what more do we know about this group? Oh, boy, they've been around for quite a while. In fact, I dealt with them 20 years ago when I was working at the uh, U.S. Justice Department during the Bush administration. Demos is one of these organizations that's against any and all kinds of election reforms. They're against voter ID. They don't want voter registration lists uh, cleaned up. Uh, they believe that aliens should be given the right to vote. I mean, you you name it. And they're on the wrong position uh, on every issue in uh, involved in election integrity. So having them involved in this uh, is a particularly uh, bad move by the administration. Well, it's a good move for them politically, but a bad move for uh, anyone who believes in honest elections. Which at the end of the day means it's a bad move for Americans. We, we yes. bank our... Our, our system largely upon the will of the people on election day and for there to be accurate votes taking place, election integrity, so that at the end of the day, the voice of the people has been heard. And that's what our government is based upon. And this is just turning it all upside down. I, I can right. tell you this, Hans, every conservative that I've spoken with, uh, when it comes to uh, the federal government uh, involved in elections, specifically the Hatch Act rules, the, the Hatch Act rules have been strictly enforced throughout our government. Is the Biden administration now banking on uh, perhaps a legacy media just ignoring the violations or uh, just uh, not raising a fuss on it? Yeah, yes. <laughs> yeah, the answer is yes to that. Plus, uh, who is supposed to uh, enforce violations of the Hatch Act? Why the U.S. Department of Justice under the control of Merrick Garland, and you and I both know that they are not going to in any way, in fact, they haven't, uh, they've neither objected to this executive order, put up any opposition to it, and they certainly aren't going to go after any of the uh, either bureaucrats or political appointees within different departments like the Department of Agriculture who are uh, engaging in partisan political activities um, uh, to carry out this executive order. That's just not going to happen. Well, when you ask who's going to enforce that, I mean, that's a legitimate question for sure. But I think uh, to begin with, Congress has, Congress has already stepped in with this, with the Hatch Act. 
Uh, and, right. you know, so the, the law is there. Now you need the enforcement of the law. And unfortunately, you've got the executive branch pushing the violation of the law and they're responsible for enforcing it. So uh, what a mess we have. If I can, I'd like to switch gears real quickly before sure. our time gets away from us. Um, I, this week, the uh, a state appeals court uh, declared that a New York City law that would prevent uh, would, would permit non-citizens to vote in local elections uh, to be unconstitutional. So your right. reaction to that? Well, thank goodness they did it. They said it was unconstitutional under the state's constitution. Uh, the law the law that New York passed was really bizarre. If you were an alien, not a U.S. citizen, as long as you uh, either had a green card or, or, more importantly, if you had a work permit, you, you would be able to vote. Uh, Joe, do you realize that means that if, for example— uh, you were a reporter for the Russian propaganda newspaper Pravda. Why, you would have a work permit to be in the U.S. and you would get to vote in New York City elections. Um, fortunately, the Court of Appeals said this violates the state constitution of New York, which says you have to be a citizen to vote. But to tell you, show you just how bad some of the judges are that we have these days, look, this was a three to one decision. You had one wow. judge dissenting and saying that a provision in the New York Constitution that says you have to be a citizen to vote doesn't actually mean you have to be a citizen to vote. Wow. Well, you know, I, there's no question we have people watching and listening right now who are saying, well, well thank God that thank God this did uh, come out as being seen as unconstitutional. But what about our U.S. Constitution? There are many pushing for the same thing on the federal level right. as well. Yeah, they are. Now, fortunately, right now, there is in place a federal law that makes it a felony for an alien to register and vote. But uh, unfortunately, again, you have a uh, Justice Department that really isn't interested in enforcing uh, that provision, even though... There's plenty of information out there about aliens who have registered and voted, but, you know, the Justice Department just isn't going to prosecute them. So I, I hear this all the time. Does, does this effort uh, get to, uh, to get out the vote and all that's going on, does this say anything about the administration's immigration strategy, you think, when we're looking at all these uh, laws coming up to allow illegals to vote? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, look, I think there's a direct connection. Look, there are many reasons why we have an open border and why the left thinks that's a good idea. Everything from the fact that they hate our, our culture and they want uh, as many aliens coming in as possible. But the long term goal, particularly for Democratic political consultants, is they see all of these aliens coming in as as potential voters. And they think the more that come in, the more and greater the probability that in the future uh, they will be voting and consolidating power for Democrats. Additionally, remember, and you know this, having been in the U.S. House, unfortunately, our apportionment after each census is based on the total population of the U.S. So states with large numbers of illegal aliens like New York and California actually get more members of Congress. Very unfair. That needs to be changed. But right now, because of its uh, large population of illegals, California, for example, probably has at least half a dozen members of Congress it should not have. Should not have. Absolutely. Well, Hans, thank you so much. Yeah, I don't know of anybody who knows this stuff any better than you do. Thank you for breaking <laughs> it down for us. Sure. Hope you have a great weekend. Thank you for joining us. All right, Thanks friends, that wraps up this edition of Washington Watch. Hope you have a fantastic weekend. Keep trusting the Lord. God bless you. We'll see you next week right here on Washington Watch. Washington Watch with Tony Perkins is brought to you by Family Research Council and is entirely listener supported. Portions of the show discussing candidates are brought to you by Family Research Council Action. For more information on anything you've heard today or to find out how you can partner with us in our ongoing efforts to promote faith, family, and freedom, visit TonyPerkins.com. Also, to leave a comment about Washington Watch, call our watch line at 1-866-372-7234. That's 1-866-372-7234.